everybody, welcome to day two of the Coming Out of the Broom Closet five day challenge. I hope you are doing well today. We've gotten so many great submissions over the last 24 hours with everybody's workbook journal posts, and it's just been awesome to read everything. All right, let's see here. Okay, so we got a couple people coming in. Looks like I am live. Hi, Susan. Hi, Lynn. Good to see you. Hi, Pamela. Good to see you. I was just petting my kitty. And of course, <laughs> there's kitty hair in my lipstick. Okay. We are ready to go, I think. Can someone let me know if they can hear and see me okay? Hi, Susan. Good. All right. Hi, Karen. Good to see you as well. Awesome. So I've had so much fun uh, reading everybody's stories, how they actually came to the craft, and I've noticed some really interesting parallels between a lot of us. A lot of us um, started out, you know, with our first spiritual awakening in our early 20s, or we kind of like came back around to it. It's something that a lot of us knew in the beginning, but we didn't have a word or a way to actually express what it is that we were what we were feeling on the inside. So that's something I noticed through a lot of people. Yes, you are here live. Hi, Karen. Hi, Pamela. I just saw that you went live. I'm going to listen to your watch and listen to your video after we're done here today. Hi, Marissa. Awesome webinars this week. Oh my gosh, I've been enjoying Marissa's. Marissa, put a link down. Um... <laughs> this is this is Kupo. He doesn't make an appearance very often because he's very, very, very shy. He's very, very, very shy. Hi, Freya. Yes, so uh, Marissa, if you would, put a link down in the, in the comment section to your group. Marissa's doing a webinar series this week. It's really awesome. It's about changing our relationships to certain stimulants like coffee, um, tobacco, uh, tea and some other ones too. It's been very interesting so far. I've been really enjoying it. Susan says, I see a kitty cat. <laughs> yes, that's Kupo. He's um, Kupo the Brave because he's not very brave. <laughs> His sister is the one that's got the um, half, she's half orange tabby and half black kitty and then she's got like calico spots and things like that. <laughs> All right, it looks like everybody's here. Good to see everybody today. Happy Tuesday. I'm so excited to be here with you. Everybody has so much fun with the quizzes, too. So just to clarify a couple of things. So the quizzes weren't mandatory. That quiz that I gave you for the, your element of power, that was just something fun. Hi, Tammy. I can see you, too. Good to see you. It was just something for fun. And it was really interesting to see kind of how everybody related to what actually the quiz kind of spit out. And I just designed it to just be a fun exercise, just something interesting and fun to do, right? Um, and I thought it was really interesting that Happy O-Star, Happy O-Star, first day of spring, it's so exciting, right? And I just thought it would be interesting to put it together and just kind of set it out and see how people actually reacted to that because one of the core foundations of witchcraft is working with the elements. And a lot of people actually took it to an astrological level. I'm sorry, I'm so itchy because I was just playing with the kitties. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be like scratching my face. Um, okay, so what am I saying? Oh yeah, so the elements in witchcraft are, it's one of the ways that we express witchcraft is working with the elements. And a lot of people took it to an astrological place, which is awesome. I think that's really cool. It was not something that I actually intended, and let me tell you why. So in witchcraft, actually the elements are kind of their own individual powers, and we work with actually all of the elements, and we express the elements in different ways. Now in astrology, yes, um, you know there are certain elements that go with certain signs and things like that. It's its own system in itself, but witchcraft is also its own system, and within the elements, they express through you in certain ways. So. Some of the things that I was seeing was that a lot of people were really, um, you know, gravitated towards certain types of answers that were based off of 
also certain types of astrological occurrences and significances as well. Like, for example, um, you know, Earth-based people are naturally, if you have a lot of Earth in your astrological chart, you're going to be drawn. Oh, no, is the stream not okay? Okay, let me know if it's okay now. But, so people are going to be drawn to certain things that are uh, expressed in their astrological chart. But, in witchcraft, each of the powers are kind of their own certain, you know, element in, in and of themselves. And we work with them individually, but also we work with them in many different ways. And what I thought was really interesting is that the people that weren't actually aligned with whatever spit the quiz spit out at them, in my opinion, that could be a couple of different things. First of all, it could be that there is uh, an element that is maybe missing from your life. So if you drew a whole bunch of, um, you know, you drew water and maybe you don't have a lot of water in your chart or maybe you have a lot of water overall in your chart, there seems to be two different things. It seems to be either people didn't, they try to associate it with their sun signs and things like that, which does work, but doesn't always work, right? So in my opinion, what that kind of meant was that there was an element missing from your life. So if you drew a lot of water, for instance, then perhaps maybe you need some fire to kind of balance out that water. So, or if you drew like air, maybe you need some earth because maybe you need to make those thoughts more tangible, bring it down to the physical in the physical reality on the earth plane. Okay. So just think about, you know, it, it's okay if it didn't actually align with you. It was just in fun. It do, it's not, it wasn't trying to like psychoanalyze you or anything like that. And it wasn't, saying that you are, that was going to be your element for the rest of your life. It is just an element that you are expressing right now. And then there was also people that were saying, well, it was really hard to choose because I identified with multiple of the choices, and it just depends on what kind of mood I am in, too. And that's perfectly okay. That's actually how it really is. Every single day, there might be a different type of elemental influence in our life, depending on how we're feeling. Does that kind of make sense with everybody? So... If, if you were like, this doesn't really resonate with me, it's totally okay. And I want you to ask yourself, why doesn't it resonate with me? Is it because I actually need that energy in my life? Or is it because I'm trying to embrace? Or is it maybe because this is who I have been in the past, but now I'm trying to embrace a different type of element? Okay? So, awesome. Good. Good. People are reacting. <laughs> So today's topic is going to be all about um, feminism, and it's going to be about the political aspects of witchcraft. And I am, just to let you know, going to be talking about some adult concepts. So if you have little ears around you, you might want to put your earbuds in or put your headphones on, or you might want to come back to this video at a later date. There are going to be some trigger warnings here. I will be talking about contraception. I will be talking about um, your computer's lagging. Uh-oh, I hope it's not the stream. <laughs> My internet was pinging okay. But I will be talking about um, uh, contraception. I will be talking about sexuality. I will be talking about abortion. I will be talking about, um, you know, a lot of those different types of topics. and. If you, you know, ha have a past with that, it, it may be triggersome. So I just want to warn you up front, I don't want to send you into some emotional crisis without intending to do that. So I will allow you to make the decision for yourself if this is a live stream that you can view right now or maybe later or maybe not at all. Everybody groovy with that? Okay. So there are two books that I really want to bring to your attention. Um, first and foremost, there is a book called The Feminine Mystique, and I'm getting that link for you right now. It is a really, really, really good book. It was um, pretty much one of the first books that came out that was talking about what we call second wave feminism. Witchcraft is sexual truth. Thanks for the warning. It is. Um, and especially if you dive into Wicca, especially. It, it very much is. Okay, so you are going to get this link now. Um, and let's see. 
Pamela says, I'm finally okay with it because my parents asked me what I can do or to do to fix, oh, your, when kids are sick and, st and such. So do my kids now. My parents are fine with it, thankfully, and it's the family and myself are what matter, not others, mostly for myself. Susan says groovy. Pomegranate. Sorry, but can you give that warning again? Yes. Um, so I will be talking about topics like sexuality, abortion, contraceptive um, methods, and things like that. So if, if that is an issue for you, go ahead and just go ahead and click off now. And then you can figure out the rest later if you want to watch this stream or not. Or if it's a good time for you. Um, we'll probably be also talking about the R word as well. Okay, so there's this book that came out. It's called the, the Feminine Mystique, and it, it was written by an American woman, and it was all about basically the plight of the uh, women, women in America during, like, the, after the first wave of feminism. For the, so the first wave of feminism in America was in the late 1800s, and this is where women were um, out there uh, trying to, protest and get rights for women to vote to be included in the political arena and to also seek education. Uh, women weren't allowed to go to college. So we had women out there in the late 1800s fighting for our right to simply just vote and to pursue a college education. There were some other things involved with that as well, but that was the main gist of it. And then, um, you know, we, we won bra burning. Yeah, Lynn says. So, um, you know, we were fighting for many different things. We're going to kind of dismantle this, this as we go on in stages because it's it, it can be as simple as the right to vote, but it, it gets so much more intense and in-depth as we go on and we start pulling these veils off and start seeing how just how interlinked feminism and witchcraft really is. And I also want to uh, just state that, you know, this is not, I'm just a normal person in the world. I'm just a woman living in the world. You know, I'm not what I would consider to be an activist. Maybe through my work I am an activist, but I don't, like, I don't go to protests and things like that. So, it, you know, I don't want anybody to think that I'm like, trying to push an agenda on anybody, but I am just speaking from my own personal experiences as being a woman in this world, and I think we all definitely have the right to do that, you know. So, um, in the late 1800s, we finally got the right to vote, we got the right to go to college, um, and then, you know, we had certain things going on with Roe versus Wade, and the um, we started bringing in these concepts of the, the rights of women and their reproductive uh, rights, their reproductive health, and things like that. And then, about half a, uh, half a century passes, and then in the late 40s, 50s, and 60s, we start seeing this second wave of feminism um, coming out with, um, you know, more ways to grant equal rights to, at the time, it was really just about women, it, it and originally, it wasn't so much about, like, personal, cultural diversity, which is kind of like where we're at right now. Um, with the protests and uh, the identity of feminism right now and modern culture. But back then, it wasn't really about, like, equal rights for everybody, but so much of, more about um, just equal rights for women, okay? Pamela says, I don't go either. I like to look at both sides. I'm very much the same way. I, I kind of like to just make my own decisions, and then, you know, I, I choose to do my work in different ways, and it, that's totally okay, too, and we're going to talk about that. It's not that you can definitely go to protests and things like that, that I'm not saying that you can't do that or it's wrong to do that, but how you choose to express your feminine activism is a personal choice, and it doesn't always look like bra burning. It doesn't always look like going to protests and things like that, so there are many different forms of expression when it comes to feminism and witchcraft is one of those forms of expression that we're going to talk about today. Okay, so this book was written in um, the 1960s, I believe, and it was written by a woman who was kind of just mulling over the plight of, you know, the American women at the time who really, um, you know, they there was a lot of advancement made. We could vote, we could go to college, and some women, um, especially during the... Uh, First and Second World Wars, we were 
getting jobs in factories and we were getting out of the house and we were building, um, uh, you know, like working on airplanes and, and doing administrative type of work, um, specifically to help, um, the, the getting rid of the, um, uh, Nazi Germany and things like that, you know? So we did end up going to work during that period of time, but after the war was over, um, women who had first kind of gotten that first taste of what it's like to have something other than just being at home and just being responsible for children and procreation and the cooking and the cleaning. Um, you know, a lot of women were disgruntled after the Second World War um, around the 1940s into the 1950s. <clears throat> Rachel says, first wave, I want to do my own thing at home. Let me vote still. Second wave, let me keep my job after the boys come home from the war. Basically, yeah. What I'm talking about. Third way, let me do what I want with my body. Aha. Uh -huh. And fourth way, let me identify as a woman, be my own body's boss, and the choice to be home or go to work is mine. Yeah. And even more now, fourth wave, fifth wave feminism, where we're kind of at right now, is also um, inclusive of other marginalized people. We're talking about minorities, immigrants, black people, Hispanic people, Asian people, especially um, uh, disabled people. So the umbrella is definitely widening as we continue on and there's always going to be some sort of social justice thing to fight for always there's always going to be people who are taken advantage of people who are exploited so it our work and sadly is really never done i hope that i see in the future when i'm 80 or 90 years old hopefully i make it that long but i hope to see when i'm 80 you know um that we don't have to uh fight for any certain singular type of marginalized person that would be the dream come true wouldn't it but you know i don't know i can't really say that look at how much we've changed and how much we've influenced over the last 125 years especially in america you know but in our you know our country and in, in what we call western civilization this is europe north america you know the places that we consider not to be so much like a third world country um Unfortunately, we still have a long way to go. There are still other countries that are still burning witches. There are still other countries that are still doing forced female castration and sterilization and things like that. So it's, it, I mean, this is going to go on pretty much for probably the next thousand years is probably my assumption, trying to get the world up to speed, you know. Rachel says, <laughs> okay, hold on, there's some good comments here. Pamela says, I think the bra burning might have been a bit too far. Plus, on the other hand, I would rather wear a bra as much as I hate them. Yeah, and so, okay, so here's the thing with the whole bra burning thing. It's not necessarily that women necessarily really want to burn their bras. What it is, is it's a display. It's an aggressive display. And sometimes for um, for social, social justice, sometimes we have to take our displays to the extreme for people to notice and to get attention. So it's not necessarily like women, all women want to burn their bras who identify as feminist, but it's more so about just getting the shock value and gaining that attention and gaining that traction. Marissa says feminine means, feminism means everyone. Yeah. Marissa, it was always that way for the real radical feminists. Yes. Rachel says, exactly, because the problem with the second wave uh, was it was during the civil rights movement. Yes. Uh-huh. And women of color had to choose, do I stand with my husband and my brother? Yes. And they also had to choose, do I identify first as a black, uh, as an African American person, or do I identify first as a woman? And that was definitely one of the, the difficulties of uniting people at that period of time during a time of still having racial segregation and things like that, that were um, doing nothing but perpetuating and manipulating, um, you know, social justice causes and further de uh, de devising, um, yeah, getting people, like, separating people. Pomegranate says, toxic masculinity harms men and women alike. We need to restore the balance. And it's not just, the sad thing is that it's not just toxic masculinity anymore. It's also toxic um, femininity. And it, I mean, it's, 
we would like to blame toxic masculinity and yes for a long period of time it has been toxic masculinity masculinity that has perpetuated this for the last two thousand years but we we're we are at a really interesting turning point in, in society and just the world in general our evolution in general because it's not so much about the the men anymore but it's also about the women as well and also these ideas of cultural and racial purity i mean there's there's it's all over so yes it part of it is toxic masculinity but there are so many other ways to be toxic as well so yeah female circumcision very scary uh, Lynn says, I'm a strong advocate for equal pay for equal work. I didn't burn my bra. I was too young, but I remember the protest in town. Rachel says, it's interesting, though, now that we're in the fourth wave, we get toxic feminine. Yeah, that's basically what I was just talking about. Um, and it's just as bad as the masculine. Yes, it is just as bad as toxic masculinity. Catherine says, I don't need a bra. I'm too little. Well, late, honey, that is your choice, right? And that's what it's all about. Kristen says, I wonder if some of the bra burning also signified the horrible corset wearing. Yeah, we're going to talk about that as well, which to me represented enslaving women literally by tightening the ribcage so much that their rib cage, ribs were damaged and breathing was hampered. Yeah, so they, you know, they were too tired and too much in pain to do anything about it. So um, for this version of, uh, of what we consider beauty, and, you know, Marissa says what feminists called good soldier feminism. Yeah, so, I, you know, and I'm not saying, I'm definitely not saying that just because someone identifies as a feminist or a witch that they're automatically a good person or that they use their power for good, but I think it's more just understanding what the underlying, uh, you know, beliefs and causes for feminism are and then using that power for good because we do, we're not, like, we're not just fighting toxic masculinity anymore, we're, we're also fighting women who are also toxic as well so there's so many different um, pivot points in which that we are fighting against so we need people who identify in multiple different ways so that we can get the whole of the movement uh, you know much more advanced because because what they're doing um, you know what it's really doing is it's spreading us out and working uh, horizontally you know instead of working from the bottom and working up so it's just a way to kind of keep women especially and um, LGBT um, and anybody who identifies any as anything other than heterosexual and white and male um, it's just basically keeping people busy and, and causing infighting and wasting time and you know allowing the powers that are in, uh, allowing the people that are in power right now to just continue to further their own agenda so it's crazy it is crazy Rachel says, eh, that's if you follow the empire period of corsets. The years before were just flying. It's like the extremist version of racism, sexism. That's the big costume history issue. Yeah, and we'll talk about the, um, you know, the choice to wear a corset, the choice not to wear a corset, and we're going to talk about that kind of thing. Um, it, we're, I'm definitely not a bra burning feminist in that, or you know, corset burning in that. I don't think any woman should wear a bra or corset. Absolutely, I think that you should always do what you want to do, and you can express yourself however you want to express yourself. The problem then comes in when you're tr when people are trying to control other people and are trying to give almost these ultimatums to say, if you wear a corset, then you are anti-women, and I just don't believe that at all. That's not in my heart at all. Freya says, I wonder also if this is where it comes, beauty is pain. Beauty has always been painful no matter what I mean just look at the geishas just look look into geisha history and you want to talk about pain just to look beautiful um, but it's all kind of relative too Rachel says men wore corsets as well they did um, yes they did Pamela says thank God you brought that up I didn't know there was a word for it about women Yes, and you know, every woman's going to have their own uh, beliefs and values in the world that is coming from themselves and their free thinking, their free thought, but also coming from, you know, culture and religion and things like that, too. So it's a very, very sticky subject, which is why we, we should talk about it, even if we're not experts in it, even if what we feel or say isn't necessarily politically correct, because I think if we can just open the dialogue and just 
just talk about how we're feeling. Just talk about how we feel about things and share our experiences. I think that can only do nothing but good. Rachel says, I love corsets and I look good in them. I have a German steel bone corset in my bedroom. So, <laughs> you know, I have these things as well. Now, the question therein lies, am I, why am I buying these things? Am I buying these things because I feel that I won't be feminine without them? Or am I buying these things because it is a way for me to express my femininity that I, that I personally feel is attractive, right? Susan says, yeah, when people try to tell someone to behave a certain way or wear a certain thing, that's when I start getting a headache from the depths of Hades. Right. Kristen says, if you had to wear a corset every day so tight it was painful, I don't think you would think so. Right, and it's all about choice. It's all about coming back to choice. Do I choose to wear this or is this something forced upon me? Christine says, I love my corset, great for back pain, and if I'm standing for a long time, it really energizes me. Yeah, I mean, it's, and it's not about something being good or bad, and I think that's what we really want to talk about today, is that it's not that certain expressions of femininity is necessarily bad or good, but again, coming back, is it your choice to do this or is it not your choice to do this? Is this being forced upon you? That's where the real, I think, injustice lies. <laughs> Karen says, or are you buying it because then you want to get crazy at the Renfest? Yes. Also go to Renfest. So. <laughs> Rachel says, Kestarti, am I saying that right? Was an issue. So we have a balance of all kinds of oppression. We do. We do. And I, I think that, you know, no matter what we feel and believe and what our beliefs are, I think we can all kind of agree that it co always comes back down to choice, right? Because, uh, you know, I don't want this to become a, uh, a divisive topic. I really just want this to be a uniting topic. And of course, it starts with the conversation. So everybody's doing great so far. But I know, I know that this, can, this type of conversation can trigger people and bring up some unresolved things and it can make you question things about yourself that you do and it can bring up feelings of resentment and guilt and shame or it can even bring up uh, you know feelings of pride and, and joy as well so we are on a huge spectrum right now just having this conversation Rachel says when they made young boys eunuchs so they had high-pitched feminine voices Castrati. Castrati. Okay. I'll have to look into that. I'm not sure exactly what that all entails. If you want to post something in the group, that would be totally cool too. I'm very much interested in just about everything. So read this book. <laughs> Anyways, read this book. Um, it, it first came out uh, around the 1960s and it just kind of talks about some of the struggles that women had. And then there's another really good book that I want you to check out. Um, as if you can buy these from Amazon, definitely do that and, you know, give money to the people who wrote these books are in, well, they're probably not alive still. I'd have to look, but if they aren't alive, usually the money goes to the family. So if you can, um, you know, afford to buy the books yourself and have the books and read them, definitely do that. But there are, um, places online where you can get these books for free and basically what you type in is, um, uh, drawing down the moon PDF and try to find a link to download it and the feminine mystique. So leading me into the next book that I would really love for you to check out. Charlene, Charlene actually brought this up yesterday and I was like, ah, it must be reading my mind. It must be psychic because I was going to talk about this book. Drawing down the moon is a very um, important book, I think, to witches because it, it does go into the initial, um, you know, new age type of witchcraft that was brought over from Europe to America in, in the 1900s, uh, early late 1800s, early 1900s. And <clears throat> this book is really uh, different and unique in, in and of itself because it is not necessary, it is a book on magic, but it's not necessarily a book just on magic. It actually comes from a uh, sociological type of standpoint. So not only does it mix um, magic, but it also mixes politics as well. And this was one of the first kind of public releases of 
connecting feminine, uh, femininity, feminism, and magic, and also political activism as well. And if you haven't had a chance, I'm not going to go too much into the history of feminism and witchcraft. I did post a bunch of very quick two, three, five minute videos in the group that you can find that just kind of go over and give a little bit of, of, of history about how that kind of came into being. It talks about the, the witch political movement, which was um, a group of women that would go out and do protests and displays for political activism, and they would bring their broomsticks, they would wear their hats, and um, they would be casting spells and, and, and chanting spells and things like that. So definitely give that a look. See, go back into the group and, and kind of look at all that. I don't I don't have enough time today to give you like a full back history of it, but I would encourage you to do your own research and to kind of Google things and watch these videos and just kind of go down the rabbit hole, as it were, and, and start your own journey towards understanding the connections between uh, feminism and witchcraft. <laughs> Pamela says, I'm waiting to get a black belt to make sure I can stand up a back belt. I thought you said black belt. I was like, well, that'll work too. <laughs> I would have had, I would have hated to wear a corset and probably gotten pissy, my pissy rebellious attitude, right? Susan says, right, honestly, I would like it to be a nice balance of masculine and feminine, not too much of one or too little of the other, but an embrace of each, if that makes sense. It totally makes sense, Susan, to me, and, you know, I think that's where a lot of the whole, um, you know, this, this whole movement out there for LGBT people and people who identify like as non-binary and they, or they uh, identify as gender fluid. I think this, th this whole movement with that and, um, you know, this, this perpetuation of that, there are more genders, there are more genders than just male or female. And I think that is like the expression, the, the beginning of, uh, expression of that. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because things don't always express themselves how we, ma magic itself doesn't always express itself how we originally think, but the magic does work and it works for the highest good of all. That's my, just my personal opinion and kind of how I view, uh, magic in general. So I think personally, that's kind of where this balancing is coming out, uh, with this, with the, you know, this um, movement with LGBT and and having multiple genders and things like that. Again, I'm not politically correct. <laughs> I'm just a person living in this world. Sometimes I don't know how to frame certain things or talk about certain things. But again, I think you kind of get what I'm saying. Oh, no, Jan, I'm so sorry. She says the stream's lagging out too much for her. Pamela says, I think I've earned a black belt. <laughs> I think you have. I think you have, too. Pamela says, usually I can't handle if there's a lot of women at a job, but then it depends on the women, too. We're going to talk about that as well. We're definitely going to talk about that. Why don't we just talk about it now? Um, you know, and, and as women, we are. There is a, a stereotype out there that women are bitches to one another, that we gossip about one another, that we're catty and jealous, and we have, like, these mean girl um, memes and and. You know, what that really is, in my opinion, is that's the to toxic femininity that we're talking about. Um, it's not the only aspect of toxic femininity, but it is a major one. And it's also one that is perpetuated also by the patriarchy as well. Um, there's a reason why, you know, guys are really into female wrestling and things like that. There's, I mean, there's a whole bunch of, you can just look at the whole list of, laundry list of fetishes out there that are involving women being pitted against women and that it's somehow a turn on for men. Um, I think this has a lot to do with personally, I think it has a lot to do with, um, again, spreading the infighting with women. And, and if women are pitted against each other or if they're judging other women for not being feminine enough, or not expressing their femininity in uh, a way that is kosher with the current cultural standards, you know, the thin waist, the big boobs, the large hips, the long legs, long blonde hair, long straight blonde hair, um, big lips, you know, these, these sort of things that are popular in our culture right now, which does change over time. But I think that 
a lot of that that mythos that it comes to like women being pitted against women is just again bred in order to keep women um fighting to not to not unite them um and i think that women especially um i don't know about you but i've noticed that whenever i go somewhere or something like that i I, especially in the past if i didn't have my hair done or my makeup done it wasn't that i was worried about what other men thought about me it was more that i was worried about what women thought of me and i know that when i see someone a woman that is strikingly beautiful there is something within me that does feel a measure of jealousy that feels a measure of inadequacy and I believe that this is something that is bred into us because individuality is not really celebrated because we are constantly inundated by these subliminal marking, not just subliminal, a lot of it's subliminal, but a lot of it's just wide out in the open and that's just kind of what it is and that's just what we consider normal at this point in time. Um, and I personally feel that we are almost brought up to feel and believe that women are our greatest enemy and it is not in fact um, the patriarchy and the men who perpetuate the oppression of women and even LGBT Um, but in fact it is uh, women become the enemy and if you have women pitted against women you're just you're not going to be able to unite women it's just it's another thing you know like how the police would give poor ghettos of, of black people they would give them um, cocaine to go sell to, and then they would form gangs and it would become turf wars and things like that. Like this shit really happens. There are accounts of this sort of control and manipulation. And we would be naive to think that they, those same people, those same people that are pitting races against races, um, would not also be doing that to women in general. Um, Pamela says women dress for each other, not for the men, you know, in a lot of cases, I I really do agree with you. I really do agree with you. Rachel says, hi, Summer. I see you. (laughs) Summer is just messaging me. Okay. Pamela says, it's nice to have a couple of men in a job, but I was raised mostly by my dad and called son. (laughs) Sorry there. So I have a lot of masculinity around me. So that's where you're most comfortable. Rachel says, I feel there would be a balance once we admit the toxicity on both sides. Just like there's dominating porn for men, there's stuff like that for women. We sexualize and manipulate each other, even if it's not in apparent ways. Yes, again, it comes down to, it's not necessarily that um, BDSM porn is bad or that porn is bad or the way that women are portrayed in porn is bad because at, at the end of the day, it is women's choices to engage in those activities. Again, it comes down to choice. Is it their choice to be expressed in that way, to engage in those activities? Or is it because they feel like they have to in order to be successful or to be accepted in the porn industry? You know, that's kind of like, that's kind of where I I feel about that. (laughs) Rachel says, I get that way just because my husband and I look older than we are. So a lot of 40 to 45 year old women would hit on my husband whether I was there or not. And it made me territorial. Yeah. I mean, there is a, there is definitely a subsect of women. Um, and we as women also have to learn how to, um, understand when someone is simply being friendly versus being, um, manipulative. I mean, there are definitely women out there who love to date married men. Um, and they like to be homewreckers for some reason, and um, they enjoy that, but there's also a subset of women who are manipulated by men into these relationships, and you know the the men will tell, and men and women, it's not just it's not just men, it's men and women who will tell their um, their side partners that oh we're not sleeping together anymore, or we're not living together anymore, or you know um, we're just not emotionally connected, or we're getting a divorce soon, or you know. There is the perpetuation of that as well, and I think it's important for women especially, but everyone in general, to kind of be able to, and especially use your psychic abilities and your intuition to know when someone is actually being threatening versus when someone's actually just being friendly. 
and I think as women, we do get very ter- territorial with that. Um, and, and I, it's, it is sad that we, that we live with that type of thing. I know when a beautiful woman walks by, I know that I'm not looking at her. I'm looking at my husband. I'm seeing if he notices her. And for a long time, I would get annoyed when, um, my husband would notice another woman that, um, was society's, um, version of what is considered beautiful. Um, especially for me, it would be thin women because I am not a thin woman. I am a, I'm a large woman. Um, and so I got, I, and so this bothered me for a long time, but I finally, um, I got to the point where I asked myself, does this actually cause a problem in my relationship? Am I just as guilty for noticing her beauty? Can I appreciate this woman's beauty with my husband without feeling jealous? or territorial and I really had to work on that for a long time and I still get I still get a little bit of a feeling in the pit of my stomach but I know that my attitude towards that woman is more to do with my insecurities than anything to do with my husband at all and I know that by seeing this woman as an ally if she's not if she's not doing anything that is actually harming me why can't I appreciate her beauty you know what I mean why can't I see her as an ally Trigger warning in my next statement. Okay, we'll get to that. Karen says, I feel a jealousy at first, but then I want to be friends with the beautiful ladies. Me too. <laughs> Me too. I think you're right that it is programmed into us to be jealous. It is because, um, you know, it, it, it truly is. Are there men and women out there who do cheat and things like that? Yes. But um, are there men and women out there who are faithful and don't do that kind of thing? Yes. So it's like, okay, are we going to attract the people that are on the same, you know, wavelength as us, or are we going to feed into the victimhood of that? Because no matter what, I mean, that's just how it is, at least right now and where we are in our evolution. Susan says, "Mm mm-hmm, women pitted against women for sure. Had a few instances, unpleasant instances of that crap, and let me tell you, it screws up your mind, and it really freaking sucks. Yeah, it, it does. Pamela says, we women should be building each other up. Yes. Pamela says, most of the time for the dressing. Right. <clears throat> Tammy says, trigger warning, by the way. I have been judged by other women due to the fact that I chose to keep my child that was a result of a date rape and then having to put her up for adoption. We're going to talk about that, too. Thank you for sharing that. Rachel says, and that is your choice, Tammy, sending you all the hugs. Right. Hi, Kai. Good to see you. Tammy says, thank you, Rachel. I get that. Yeah, so, um, gosh, this is such a good, good stream. Okay, so I gave you the two books. I'm trying to keep myself on track here so I don't, so we don't turn into a five-hour stream. Um, but for the most part, um, I think what I really want to talk about today is there was a lot of women who did not identify with the word witch, okay, um, or didn't know how they felt about the word witch or weren't comfortable using the word witch. And I totally understand that because it is a very loaded word. It has a lot of energy behind it, both good and bad energy. It has a lot of ancestral history behind it. Um, but I think the what I would like to say about that is that whether you use the word witch or not, whether you identify with the word witch or not, it's go, still going to be used as a weapon against you if you can't t- come to terms with reclaiming that. That's what today's stream is really about, is reclaiming the word witch and, and why it is so necessary, even if you don't identify with that word, even if you are triggered by that word, even if you're not sure how you feel about that word, to begin making amends with the word witch and to start using it as, a, um, as something of power for yourself. Because if you don't, other people will, and they will use it as a weapon against you. So whether you you practice magic or anything like that, basically, if you are a sexually liberated woman, if you are an independent woman, if you are someone who doesn't get married, if you choose to not have children, if you grow your own herbs, if you uh, take care of your own your own body's medicine and things like that, society, there are people out there in the world, evil people, who will call you a witch, who will lump you into that that umbrella category, and who will persecute you 
for it. So you have a choice. Do you take this word? Do you bring it into your being? Do you express it in whatever way that you choose to express it? Or do you allow it to be used against you for persecution? And I think it's really important to just think about that for a minute, whether you agree with the word or whether you don't. People out there are going to use it against you. So you have the choice. You can use it for yourself or you can allow it to be used against you. Rachel says, there's a play I really recommend that has witchcraft tones in it. It's called Mitzi's Abortion. It's very powerful. It definitely might make you cry, but it gives a difference between the masculine and feminine ideals of birth. Right now to the midwife chanting with herbs and everything. Karen says, I'm a witch. I'm a witch. I'm an ordinary witch. Pam says, I think of myself as Pam. Rachel says, I recommend the vagina monologues as well. She reclaims the word cunt just like to reclaim the word witch. Yeah, I mean, there are to, to a subsect of, of patriarchal males and um, pe the people in power. I am what you call a fat feminist witch bitch cunt who, um, you know, should probably just go kill herself and to stop breeding and to stop breathing. Um, there are people out there in the world that believe that. Um, so, <laughs> it, it, you know, you have to understand that this is what you're up against and you have to reclaim it in whatever way, the word which, whatever way that feels comfortable for you. But if you don't, people are going to vouch for burning you, stoning you, drowning you, locking you up, committing you to insane asylums, which happened as well. So... Kai says, I love that which involves being an independent feminist. I'm on board with that a thousand percent. Pomegranate says, I'm still not sure if I identify with the word witch, but I'm still figuring that out and that's fine. The more weird stuff happens, the more comfortable I become with it. Pamela says, I used to call myself witch because, or was more polite than saying bitch. <laughs> yeah, um, pretty much. Um, and that just kind of goes with that whole misogyny thing where um, if, if you are a woman that says no, you're automatically a bitch <laughs> because you're not obedient. We're going to talk about that too. <clears throat> yeah, see you next Tuesday. Susie says, we have a code for the word C-U-N-T at, at work. It stands for see you next Tuesday. So when we say goodbye to someone at work, we say see you next Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and I think it's interesting, this conversation we had in the group yesterday about um, you know, labels and a lot of it was about, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to label myself. I don't, I don't want to be a label. And I totally understand that labels can be claustrophobic. I understand that they can be confining, but, um, again, you, you can either adopt those labels for yourself and use them as a source of your power and your identity, or you can allow them to be used against you as a weapon. I think it's really interesting. And also labels are, are, you know, I think a lot of people think that they're going to be forever confined into one label or that if they choose a label that they're automatically going to be that for the rest of their lives. And that's not the case either. Labels are a lot like roles and they're a lot like um, these extremes of roles that we play out in our lives in, in order to find out more about ourselves and to discover how we really feel about certain things. And sometimes when we are trying to find something out, we take it to the extreme with a label or we identify with a label, which usually comes with a community, which is a big part of having labels is communal identification, right? Um, and so that's just simply not the case. You can always change your label. You can have many labels or you can have no labels, but labels are helpful um, in terms of giving context. And also they're helpful in terms of do you allow other people to give you those labels uh, in, in such a way that it is meant to shame you or to harm you or to make you feel bad about yourself or to keep you from living your life or showing up in your business and just generally being a person who exists in the world who is not oppressed, right? So labels can definitely be helpful, but I do understand why certain people maybe don't like labels. And it's not that I would say you need to re-examine your identity to a, a label itself, but maybe think about labels in terms of spells themselves and ways that we can harness specific archetypes and energies to, um, you know, further our own agenda of equal rights and just 
simply existing in the world without being oppressed, you know? Freya says, I'm a proud witch raising little witchlings. Pamela says, a lot of light workers in the health jobs, yep. Tammy says, I just came out in my day job, mental health as a light worker. Awesome. Pamela says, I'm wondering if you guys are more mean in the U.S. than up here, and we aren't always that nice up here in Canada like everybody thinks. I think so. I think um, especially American women are definitely a, a unique breed. Um, I definitely feel privileged to be an American woman who is is an ally for people um, all over the world. I think there is a, a specific tenacity, tenacity to um, American women that is unique to our culture. Um, and I think that a lot of that has to do with not the fact that American women are more aggressive in general or that they're something other than women of other cultures, but just the fact that we have the privilege of certain freedom of expression in America, which allows for us to be a little bit more aggressive with our uh, and be more vocal about our views and not necessarily because we're different but just because we have the luxury and that privilege of being able to voice that. Does that make sense? Um, and, of course, living in a very capitalistic country, um, there, there, there's that too. Karen says, I walk my own path, I sing my own song, I beat my own drum, I'm a witch. I heal, I help, I dance, I love, I seek knowledge. I am me and I am a witch. That's beautiful. Susan says, before I moved back and before my brother outed my love of tarot last month, my family were calling me a witch because they only speculated of my interest in things like crystals, tarots, and herbs. Yeah, see, I mean, people are going to speculate and they're going to um, make assumptions about you anyways. So why not use the word witch? Why not claim that for yourself, you know? Uh, now they do know that I am into those things, and really, now is absolutely the perfect uh, time for me to come to terms with the word witch. And it does make sense of who I am, and while some may not understand that, that's the line of thought that's leaning me more to being able to actually own that I am a Christian witch. Even if someone that doesn't necessarily like labels... Because, like you said, if you own it, then it's yours. And this line of thought also reminds me of Tyrion Lannister saying in the Game of Thrones, Never forget what you are. The rest of the world will not. Wear it like armor, and it can never be used to hurt you. Yeah. That's deep. Hi, Leone. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, so you said it way more eloquently than I could, <laughs> but yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. So you can wear it as a badge of honor, or you can, um, you know, wear it as a, a pit in your stomach that, that feeds and festers shame. So, yeah, for sure. Thank you for sharing that. That was beautiful. Okay, so what are we going to talk about next? Let's see. So basically, um, I think that's a good segue into moving into kind of what Susan was talking about. Um, in terms of, of people speculating anyways. So um, no matter what, if you are a woman that is um, that is uh, saying yes or no to certain things and, and choosing to make your own decisions, people are going to automatically assume you're a witch and they're going to assign you that label anyway. So if you are someone, a woman who is sexually liberated, meaning that you are promiscuous or meaning that you didn't wait until marriage to have sex or that you saved your virginity for the perfect person or something like that, which we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But what I'm just for right now, I'm just talking about like negative assumptions there. These are not negative assumptions as they are. I do not believe these are negative things, but in terms of what other people will project onto you. Okay. So just so, so we're clear on that. So if you're sexually liberated, if you believe in contraception, if you um, didn't save yourself for marriage, if you don't go to church on Sundays, if you grow your own herbs, um, if you believe in, if you're pro-choice, if, you, if you're pro-women's um, uh, reproductive rights, if you um, choose not to have children, if you choose to um, uh, not get married, okay, or if you are an LGBT, especially if you are a lesbian woman. Lesbian women were definitely considered witches. So 
if you identify with any of those things and a whole bunch of other things that are considered against the grain, against societal norms, if you are overweight, if you don't um, adhere to dyeing your hair uh, blonde and putting yourself through, as we talked about, these very painful things for in the sake of beauty, um, if you do not subscribe to that and you do not put yourself through that and you do not have what they would consider a model uh, of femininity that is accepted, then pretty much you're a witch um, and people are going to make those assumptions about you, okay? So, whether, you know, today's feminism is so much more and it, it's just, it's so interesting and I really hope you do some research on this because feminism today is, it's more about choice. It's, it's more about choice. It's not so much about what's right or what's wrong. And, you know, it's, it's about a woman's right to choose for herself, to express her femininity in a way that it feels good to her. Susan says, I like to write words. <laughs> Is it obvious? Kai says, I'm a witch then. Yeah. And it feels good to, and it feels good to her. And she's not, um, she's not fearful that her life will be taken from her. She's not fearful that her neighbors are going to get their pitchforks and torches out and drag her ass to a stake and set her on fire. Okay. So we, you know, it's like in today's world, especially in the Western world, the civilized world, you know, it's, it's so much that we take for granted, I think. Um, but there's still women in other countries that are being burned. There's still women that are being killed and there's, there's so much negativity out there that I just, I don't think people realize that this stuff is really going on. Um, and I think that a lot of, especially American women, I think are reluctant to get on the feminism bandwagon just because their life, let's just face it. I mean, their life is pretty darn good right now. They don't really, they're not really persecuted or, or anything right now. Um, now I'm talking about specifically, you know, like white women in America and in, in, in terms of religious freedom and of course, you know, ethnic, uh, freedom and, and the, the civil rights and things like that. That is its own unique thing. But women in general, like let's, let's drop the cultural, let's drop the ethnic type of thing for a second. Let's just talk about women in general, women in general. Um, you know, their, their life is pretty good. It's not perfect. I mean, we still have to deal with, um, like for example, uh, women's health care is one of the big, big, big things right now. Um, the women's right to choose, choosing abortion or choosing pro-life and, um, or not to have an abortion, um, choosing to have a hysterectomy is, is a big one. Um, and getting our doctors to take us seriously is also a big one too. So let me know in the comment section if you've ever had a, uh, dealt with that. If you've dealt with doctors who, um, were, if you felt intuitively that they weren't listening to you or taking you seriously because you were female because you just happen to have a female body. I think it's, it's very common, but in terms of like, you know, right to vote, um, what, whatever we want to wear, there is a rape culture and things like that. But I think in terms of where we were, you know, just half a century ago, it's a lot better now than where it was. And I think that especially American women, um, have grown complacent in that. I, I think they've grown content in that for, for a really long time now for maybe the last, you know, like 20, 30 years or so. And it can be when you're, when your life is pretty darn good and you're, and you're not in fear of your life every single day in your neighborhood and you're not, uh, in fear that you're going to be ostracized from your community, which basically meant death. I mean, uh, back with our ancestors, you had to be part of a community. Otherwise you were basically on your own to fend for yourself. Good luck hunting your own food and good luck, um, building your own shelter and things like that, you know? So we still carry these ancestral fears, but, I think that a lot of women who are reluctant to get get good with feminism, um, I think that they just haven't had enough adversity in their life, honestly. Um, I think that their eyes are just kind of shut to all of the, the negativity that goes along in the world, um, all of the evil that's still out there that still needs to be addressed. Pamela says, yes, and finally they clue in or have different symptoms of heart attacks. Yeah. Tammy says, fought for three years for a hysterectomy at 27. Yes, um, you know, when I go to my gynecologist, I have PCOS and um, basically I'm infertile uh, at this point because I'm on medications to make me so, so they don't have s such bad PCOS symptoms. But it doesn't matter. Every single time I 
go into the doctor's office and I ask them about, I'm doing a partial hysterectomy to have my ovaries removed. The first question is, well, you're still, he goes, you're still young. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so he was like, can we talk to your husband about this? And the first couple of times he did that. And the last, the second to the last time, I really had to have a conversation with him. I said, look, I don't, I really just don't appreciate being asked about this. Please document it in my file that I asked about a hysterectomy and that I have uh, said that I, I'm not interested in having children. And I think at that point he got the clue. Now, last time that I went to the gynecologist and he talked to me, he did, it was like at the very last minute, he finally said something to the effect of, um, you know, I would prefer not to do a hysterectomy at your age because you're still, undecided. I'm 30. Um, I would prefer not to have a hysterectomy at your age and blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, it's just like, it's, it's still these things that we still have to fight against. But in general, my life is pretty good. You know, I don't have to fight for a lot of things in my life. And so I think that's what's uh, the main thing that's keeping people from identifying with feminism or, um, you know, especially with the toxic femininity where they're anti-feminism and they, they, they're anti they, they consider anybody who's a feminist to be a radical or an extremist. And I think that it has a lot to do with that. They just, they just personally haven't dealt with a lot of, um, adversity in their life. They haven't been shamed. Uh, they haven't lived through that in, in order to understand just how important it is. And I know for a fact that once we get complacent in it, it's even more, um, it's even, it becomes even more vulnerable because if, if people, if women all over the world, uh, it, if the women in the United States, let's say, decided to stop doing protests, decided to stop, you know, speaking out and being vocal about feminism in general, um, you know, it, it would be easier to just, just forget about it and then, you know, these attacks, they kind of sneak up on us. So it's just one of those things where there are levels to like how involved you are and, and how involved you aren't. And witchcraft, um, leading into witchcraft being a, 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 a very good expression of feminism in that it is a, it's a daily practice, it's a spiritual practice that affects so much, so many different parts of your life. And witchcraft itself is an artistic expression itself. Whether it is your religion or your spiritual beliefs, it is an art form first and foremost. It is a way to express what it is that you want to um, change in the world. And a lot of women are now choosing to express their feminism through their craft. Susan says, I did have an experience like that when I was having problems with migraines and my cycle when doctor completely waved me off. I didn't even try to find out, in fact, that I did have hormone issues as well as a cyst on the back of my brain. I did find a doctor who eventually took me serious and got me the meds I needed. I gave that doctor who waved me off a very lengthy one-star review. Lynn says, I did, couldn't have my tubes tied in 1982 in a Catholic hospital where I was born, so I had to go to a secular, secular hospital to have it done. Right. Crystal says, Jill Breaking the Goddess is an amazing book on how to incorporate feminism into your witchcraft. Awesome. Thank you, Krista. Tammy says, I had to see three psychiatrists to prove that I was of sound mind to make the choice that I didn't want any more children. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's all about the right to choose. And the right to choose whether, um, you know, you're going to be a housewife, which is totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Or whether you're going to choose to not stay at home, whether you choose to um, pursue college education or a technical degree. We don't, we barely have any women in engineering and science at all. Um, very few women go actually go into those fields. And the women that do, it's even, it's even less women that actually complete and actually find job placement within that. So, um, but it's also, you know, like the right to choose not to work at all and to, again, stay at home, which is totally fine. The right to choose whether, uh, with whom and when a, a woman loses her virginity, uh, with whom and, and, and when she marries, you know, not just having these, um, arranged marriages or these religious type of, uh, of marriages where it's good to marry within a specific religion and things like that. Um, if she even chooses to marry, right? <laughs> or the choice to have one child or seven children or 
to have no children at all, right? Um, the choice to prevent pregnancy with contraception, the choice to let God decide and to choose not to use contraception, um, the choice to uh, abort unwanted or seriously ill children, or the, the choice to have them and to support them. Either choice is fine. Uh, the choice to have the conversation even with her husband, how he feels about that, or the choice to not have a conversation with her husband about abortion. Um, you know, and, and to also on that note, to even seek her husband's opinions about it, to even go to church and ask her elders what they feel about it based on her, her religion or her spiritual beliefs, um, her faith, or to not have to go to church and ask the elders permission or what they view on it. Um, but to seek the answers within herself, right? Uh, the choice to dress and represent herself like conservatively or the choice to be proud of her anatomy and to display it. The choice to basically find fulfillment in whatever she chooses and whatever she desires within herself. So it's like, it, it really comes down for me, feminism, modern day feminism today, it comes down to me with the choice to choose to say yes or to say no um, without feeling like her life, her, her way of life is in jeopardy because of what she chooses. Does that make sense with everybody? Does everybody get what I'm trying to say with that? Pamela says, I chose to stay at home. Yeah, a lot of women do. Krista says, only you know what's right for you. Absolutely. Pamela says, I also had trouble after having my first one and then twins. Oh, your babies. Yeah. So, it's just important that we recognize that when we're trying to police, especially other women, um, and trying, let's, let's just make a pact right now. Um, let's not shame other women for their life choices. Let's not look at other women who maybe stay home or find pleasure in cooking and cleaning or find pleasure in being with their children all the time or find pleasure in making their husbands happy and, and or find pleasure in being single and not being tied down to a relationship or not choosing to have children or and not choosing to get married or, you know, let's just stop um, shaming other women, especially let's, let's stop doing that because it's only going to keep us kind of where we are right now and not really further our progression. Okay. says best live stream ever. I love this. <laughs> Thank you. It's good. It's good stuff. I tend not to be a very vocal person about my, like my political beliefs. I tend not to be a very vocal person about my lifestyle and things like that. Um, I choose personally, it's not, there's nothing wrong if you do. We all, we need as many activists for, as we can. But I, I personally have chosen, somehow I've chosen the life path of expressing it through my work um, and, and helping women, especially in helping women. Um, one of the major cruxes of my work is, uh, is giving lots of free information about how to build a business, how to run a business how to do taxes, how to do accounting, things like that. Um, and, and really, that's where my activism lies, is it lies within giving women the power, the tools um, to be self-sufficient, to, to start their own businesses if they want to, so they're not relying on their husbands. And so they can stay at home with their children and work at the same time, or they can be a housewife during the day and a psychic on the hotlines at night. And so... So we're getting rid of these, I have to choose one or the other. Um, and it's more about just, for me, giving women the tools to decide for themselves what they want in their own life. And if they want to run a business and they want to make money and they want to influence um, people in the world and they want to help other women and other men, I want to give women the tools to do that. And that's literally why I get up every single day. I mean, that's what gets me out of bed is knowing that... It, Regardless of the money, regardless of, you know, getting certain things done, like trainings and courses and things like that, I always go back to that core mission, which is helping other women. And we need more women like this in the world. We need more women. So it's like, 
if I, if I can inspire you to go out and help five women, then I consider that to be a good, a good day, you know, um, that's just kind of how I feel about it. Um, Tammy says, um, oh wait, Pamela says, I'm paying the financial price of staying home, but the kids are now, nowadays can't afford to go or stay home with the kids. That's absolutely true. I mean, we have that type of thing going on as well. Susan says, I'm absolutely on board with the pact. You know, I take dad to doctor appointments. I actually had the secretary's boss getting up on me and telling me I needed to hurry up and give my dad some grandkids. I was absolutely mortified and stunned by that. Yeah. Yeah. That is also a thing that happens. Tammy says, I live by you, make the best choice for you. If it affects my life, then I will say something. Pomegranate says, Susie, I'm, Susan, I'm sorry you had that happen to you. That's disgusting. And, you know, it, 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 they, the women think that they're actually being cute, and they think that they're being funny, and they think that they are, it's, again, perpetuating this abuse in terms that, that it's like it perpetuates abuse and, and normalizes it. It normalizes it. Not that asking people what, uh, that they need to, when they're going to have, to, when or if they're going to have children is abuse, but assuming that that's with everybody's life path, because what if Susan can't, what if you said that to someone who had an abortion? What if you said that to someone who's had seven miscarriages? What if you said that to someone who was in a freak accident that had an hysterectomy? Um, what if you said that to someone who was not privileged enough income wise to choose to adopt? Um, or to surrogate. I mean, a surrogate costs about $120,000. I've looked into it um, when my husband and I were talking about certain things that we could possibly have children um, without me having to go through the process of being pregnant. $120,000 for a surrogate. It's very expensive. Um, fertility treatments are very expensive. There is so much damage that we can do to one another if we aren't careful with how we phrase our words. Does it mean that we should walk around on eggshells all the time and be worried about offending people all the time? No, but can we just kind of switch the words that we're using? Can we just adjust the narrative just a little tiny bit to have consideration for someone other than ourselves? That's all I'm asking. <laughs> and I think that's all that feminists are really asking for. They're just asking for your consideration. Freya says, I'm going to be honest because I can't have any more children because I listened to my ex-husband and I was of a weaker mental state back then. I cannot take back that decision. But for everyone else, absolutely do what's best for you. And you're not alone with that. Lynn says, we have to stop judging women's choices. Yes. And I don't know that we'll ever stop judging people, but we can choose to be vocal about it and we can choose to keep those thoughts to ourselves, right? Catherine says, I have seizures, so I have felt like nowhere else to go. Hard to reclaim my goddess when I keep feeling like I need my family. But it's very empowering being here. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm glad you find empowerment here. Pamela says, I chose because I chose to stay home because I believed that the mom should stay at home. Well, me anyways. And I wanted to see all the first, etc. I would be very much the same way. I would definitely want, I, I, you would have to pry me, like you would probably have to drag me out by my feet away from uh, a baby because I would not want to leave them either. So I totally understand that. I didn't want anyone else raising them. That's important too, you know. And I ran a daycare at home, ironically, and did other businesses. So there's always, where there's a will, there's a way. Pomegranate says, personally, I'm totally happy with being an aunt, not a mother. I'm totally in love with that pact. Tammy says, we as women have to lift each other up, not put each other down. Right. Tammy says, let's stop competing with each other. That's a big one, too. And that's how um, we're going to seg segue into how witches do di business differently. And for the most part, witches do not compete with one another because they know if they want something bad enough, they have the magic within themselves to create that for themselves and their lives. They know that the universal energies are... Uh, limitless. They know that there is more than enough energy to go around to create whatever it is we want in life. And that's that's the core tenet of how witches do business differently. We don't compete with one another. We go, we, we put our um, 
magic into practice and we pray about it and we do magic and we manifest things and we take it upon, we recognize that we have individual responsibility and free will to manifest whatever we desire in, in our businesses especially. And what I've noticed um, in the spiritual community especially versus in the you know non-secular type of uh, women's entrepreneurial network is that I can happily say that spiritual women tend to be less judgmental of one another, tend to be less in competition with one another. Just because some Sally offers tarot readings for $15 doesn't mean that Jill has to be upset or jealous of her because um, she she's only charging $10 for a reading. In fact, um, in most cases, Jill is going to be like, how can I get to $15? How can I get to $25? What do, what, what do I need to do in my life? What book do I need to read? What modality do I need to learn? Um, you know, what crystals do I need? What herbs do I need? What spells do I need to be able to get that into my life? And it becomes a matter of focusing inwards. It becomes a matter of choosing to get that for ourselves and not necessarily choosing to be jealous or uh, feel any type of hurt or resentment towards anybody else who has something, right? Mindfulness. Absolutely, Karen. You're absolutely right. Freya says, it's imperative to lift other women up because it's not right because they have enough obstacles in life. Yeah, it, it, we, it's hard enough as it is. Kai says, I say to people who ask me when I'm having kids, well, I'd be happy to have kids if I weren't completely barren and infertile. <laughs> and so, again, you're using these labels as barren and infertile as... Um, you're using these labels that other people would place upon you as a source of your own power, right? So I think that's a really good good way to kind of use that. Pamela says, I used to say I'll rent out my firstborn to see if you want children. Seriously, though, before I finally got pregnant, I used to cry all the time that I wasn't. I looked into the other options of, of having kids. Yeah. Leonie says, God bless me with one to bring me a drink of water in my old age. That's so sweet. Nearly died having my daughter. My mother did too. I'm the only one that made it out alive. Um, there were several of us that did not. I somehow I was the one that made it out. There was about seven of us um, between uh, you know having abortions and having miscarriages. I was the only one that made it out. So it's it's, it's quite incredible. I'm very blessed for that. And it took a village of aunties to raise her. Yep, yep, it does. It takes a it takes a whole team. It takes a village, as I say. Pamela says, my kids are gone for spring break at the moment, and though they drive me nuts, I count the years until they move out. They've only been gone a couple of days, and today will, I will, I'll probably go crazy. Oh. Susan says, right, lift each other up and be cool. I shit you not, I sat right beside Patty in the shop, both of us tarot readers, and if she wasn't cool with doing a reading, she'd send them to me. If I didn't drive with a reading, I'd send the client to her. No worries. That's abs Yeah, that's basically it. There's enough clients to go around. There's enough money out there circulating in the universe to go around. Um, we don't have to fight for it. We de definitely don't have to fight each other for it. It's out there. All we have to do is figure out how to direct that, that energy and that money, that abundance to us. Perfect. Very good. Kai says, LOL, it's effective. <laughs> yeah. Catherine says, we are one. Brandy says, at age 23, I was told I was infertile, so I know that pain. However, 16 years later, at age 39, I ended up pregnant and had my son January 2016. Oh, my gosh, that's amazing. That's amazing. That's wonderful. That is so heartwarming. I love that. You know, so here's the thing. <clears throat> Who's ready to reclaim the word witch? Because I know I am. Um, I used to be really scared about people finding out that I was a witch or I, w I would also, um, you know, I tend to work with angels a lot and I tend to work a lot with Christian mysticism a lot. I don't identify as Christian. It's just the, the type of energy that I am attracted to because there is a certain lightness to it. There is a certain positivity to it. And when I was first going through, um, you know, my spiritual awakening, I'll admit I was not in a very good place. I was in a very dark place. And what I needed was the angels. I needed the positivity. I needed the light of the angels. I needed that light in my life to help balance out the dark that I was feeling. Um, 
And so for a long time, I, I really struggled. I, I thought to myself, how can I be a witch but also work with angels? How can I be a witch but also believe in Jesus? How can I be a witch but also believe in Muhammad and Buddha and Gandhi and all of these other prophets uh, that have come before us, uh, Mother Teresa, you know? How can I be a witch and believe in, in uh, and identify with people and, and prophets and ideas and concepts that were not necessarily inherently witchy, right? Uh, the the woo-woo witchy broomsticks, pointy hat, um, cauldron, black cat, you know, type of archetypes that we have for it right now. And I think the most important thing I can leave with you in this stream today is just the fact that witches, um, they express themselves in many different ways. And I would love for you all to just kind of examine how you're feeling about the word witch now, um, which leads me to the, uh, let's see, which leads me to this, which is our worksheet for today. And I really just want to know how you, how you feel about the word witch now, as opposed to how you felt about it yesterday. I would really love for you to, um, tell me a little bit about how perhaps your ideas about the word witch and identifying with the word witch has changed perhaps, or has shifted. Um, do you feel more comfortable? And it's okay if you can't, like, you know, go out and s your front door and scream out, I'm a witch. It's okay if you can't do that. But I want to know how you feel. Has the word changed um, its energy at all for you? Are you tapping into new nuances of the word witch? Are you seeing it now possibly as a source of power, um, now that you understand that if you don't take that power for yourself and utilize it, it will be used against you by the other, you know, the other agendas out there and other people who would prefer that you literally just die right now. Um, all you have to do is there's all you have to do is basically is go into the comment section of some of those videos I posted today about feminism and witchcraft just to get an idea of what you're kind of up against and to remind yourself some of the beliefs that other people have out there. I would say don't go into the comment section if you are easily triggered or, you know, you're not, it might be scary, um, but there are people out there who literally wish you death and just wish you would quit breathing. So it's kind of like that. Palm Grant says, personally, I struggle with angels due to religious links, but I'm working on breaking around that block. Yeah, then the, the thing about angels itself, my, my school is called Angelic Realm Seminary, and for the longest time, I kind of felt like I that didn't really identify with myself. I kind of felt like, but I'm a witch, and, um, you know, I'm all these other different labels. How can I possibly be the Angelic Realm Seminary? And I do believe in retribution. I do believe in, you know, in hexing and cursing, and I do believe... Um, and all of these things that are seemingly unangelic, but I think what's really helped for me is, is recognizing that there's a reason why I am drawn to that certain likeness and why we are drawn to these certain beings. And angels themselves are really interesting because they're not really associated with a specific religion itself. It's more, um, uh, it, it is kind of, I mean, it's, it's an Abrahamic type of, uh, of pantheon. But if you really look at religions across the world, you'll find that there are angels in every types of religions, all types of spiritual beliefs. So it may not necessarily be like the beings that you're at odd, like you're feeling hesitant to connect with. It might just be that uh, that word that is that you're associating them with, um, which I think is an important part of your path as well to figure out how you actually feel about that and how it works in your practice, how it works in uh, your spiritual beliefs. It's it's definitely uh, something that I and a lot of people, especially in this group, have dealt with as well, trying to come to terms with, okay, you know, the word which, the word, that's what they want. They want, they as in the people that are perpetuating the, the oppression, they want us to feel at odds with this. They want us to feel uncomfortable. And if we can say, you know what, I'm going to examine this, I'm going to see what this really has for me, and I'm going to make my own decisions and I'm not going to try to um, you know, identify with a certain sect or label in an extreme version where it's giving me an ultimatum in my life, but instead looking at it in terms of like, okay, this is what I'm really interested in and can I, can I work with these and can I come to terms with that myself? And that's just definitely a personal thing. It's very, very personal. 
Marissa says, it's like the difference between the fairies that we think of, the Celtic idea of the fairies. Yeah, I mean, it, it, these beings exist cross-culturally. There's, there's nature spirits, devas, especially in the Hindu religion and things like that. Um, but it's so interesting, just our resistance to words themselves. And I would love for you all, if you take nothing else away from this live stream, is to examine your relationship with the energy of words and not necessarily the words themselves. Brandy says, Angels, Companions, and Magic is a book from Silver Wave and with thought about getting it myself. Yeah, there's a whole, there's even a magical tradi tradition with angels called Enochian magic. Pamela says, Pomegranate, you will work through it. I had to, too. I think most of us have to. It will come in your own time. Yeah, and you have to ask yourself, um, a lot of it is, is, what am I losing by identifying with this, okay? Because we are communal beings, and we do things because uh, we want to, to know our place in the community, right? In most cases, because we are ingrained with the idea ancestrally that if we are not part of a community, that pretty much means that we are going to starve and die of uh, cold in the wilderness. So, <laughs> a lot of coming to terms with certain words has, has more to do with what we feel that we're going to lose um, by identifying with certain words. And I think it's just really interesting to think about that and understand that it's not so much about the words themselves, but what we um, misguidedly kind of feel that we are sacrificing by aligning with certain words, the energy of certain words. Yeah. Okay, awesome live stream. Um, tomorrow we are going to talk about... Uh, returning to service, okay? So this is how returning to service is how we can deal with those complex feelings. Um, if, and that's one thing that's been really helpful for me is while I'm dealing with these complex feelings, while I'm dealing with this hesitancy or the, the unknowing of how I really feel or how identifying with the word which would actually play out in my life and all these, these sort of things, what I found was most beneficial for me was to simply return to service and to simply help people because the rest will sort of work itself out. Does that make sense? So sure, you can go in and you can kind of identify with these labels and these words and things like that and it can stay in your headspace and your upper chakras and it can stay it's the theory for you and it can stay philosophy and theology for you. But until you actually get out there and get on the ground and start expressing your activism in whichever way, shape, or form you do, whether you do tarot readings for people to help people, whether you do Reiki healing to help people, um, whether you're a life coach and you, you're helping people get their lives together and things like that and trying to help lead them to what it is that they really want in life. You, the way you feel about certain words and certain labels and certain sects of, of, of this whole spirituality community will shift and change once you actually start gaining some experience within it. It will be a totally new way to, uh, you know, redefine your relationship with, with these things. You are very welcome. Yes. Okay. So I will see everybody tomorrow. Make sure you fill out the worksheet journal prompts, um, by tomorrow's stream. So some people were asking me, okay, well, what is the 24 hour period? So just make sure that your journal prompts are in before the next day's stream and I have a running tally. I have an Excel sheet that has everybody's name on it and has the days of the week and I'm just slowly tallying everybody together. Okay, thank you so much for joining me. I will see you tomorrow.